insurance, go to the aa.ie slash myaa. Mild and windy for the rest of the day. However, outbreaks of rain will extend across the country during the afternoon and evening. Highs of 12 to 16 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. Football on Off The Ball With Paddy Power The greatest football partnership Since Jeff and Heskey Now you're very welcome back Later on this hour we'll talk to former Republic of Ireland internationals Gary Breen and Damien Delaney will join us as well We'll also talk to Dan McDonald Because things are uh, changing very quickly at the FAI as we speak uh, Confirmed in the last couple of hours that Stephen Kenny's a backroom team as Republic of Ireland senior manager. Damien Duff on board, Keith Andrews and Alan Kelly. And then the under-21s, Jim Crawford will stay as under-21s boss and John O'Shea will uh, join his backroom team. So that is the latest after the news yesterday that Mick McCarthy's tenure would end with immediate effect. Very happy to say we're joined by Gary Owens. He's the interim chief executive at the FAI. Afternoon, Gary. Hi, Nathan. How are you? Hi, it's Joe here. Sorry. Oh, Joe, sorry, I thought it was Aidan. I was talking to Sorry, but Joe. Hi, Joe. How are you? Very well. So uh, things have been moving very quickly over the last couple of days. Could you take us through the decision-making process, the timeline? Well, it probably started, as you know, it would have been in the background for a while. But uh, last Wednesday, when UEFA officially sort of postponed the playoff match from June, we then had to kind of move quickly and decisively, really. Um and that was in everybody's interest. Uh, it was in Stephen's interest, and it was obviously a mixed interest. Um, so since Wednesday, we've been working with the guys, I mean, very professionally. I have to say Mick was very professional about it. Uh, we had been working with Stephen on uh, building a kind of team with him. Um, so we had done a bit of work before that in terms of uh, the, the, the depth of the team that Stephen would have when he eventually did take over. So we decided that it was in everybody's best interest to kind of move now. And um, we talked to Mick about that on Friday. And uh, as you've seen from his interview, he was really professional about it. And um, we then moved quickly to kind of put the team in place. And we were very keen to put a strong team in place where, you know, that would give us succession in the future. Uh, it has a really young, uh, I think, strong look about it. And uh, both at, at the national level and under-21 level. And uh, we're very, very pleased with the team we put in place now. And had Damien Duff, for instance, been sounded out previous to the last couple of days? Oh, he, he was definitely on our wish list. I mean, we were keen to have him on board. Um, and we moved quickly since Wednesday. Um, so, yeah. you know, Damien's going to finish out with, with Glasgow Celtic until probably August, depending on when the season restarts, if, if it does there. Um, but, you know, he's a big addition to us, as is John O'Shea at the under-21 level. And uh, obviously Keith has been working... Uh, with Stephen before, and then Jim has been working with Stephen before as well. So um, we've got a nice combination of c continuity between everybody and then a uh, really good succession in place at both uh, National and Under 21. And I think I feel that both teams will kind of work closely together. Uh, Niall Quinn was speaking on FAI TV uh, two weeks ago. This was when we were still thinking about Slovakia happening in June. And he, he was asked about the dilemma, you know, if, if, for instance, Ireland got to the Euros. And he said at that stage, I don't think there's any point in trying to do something about that now. We're still in the position where we don't even know if we're going to the Euros or not. We will know on the 10th of June. And I would have thought that 10th of June would be a good time to start worrying about that particular instance. Uh, so that certainly suggests once it was moved beyond June and into, you know, post 1st of August, uh, Stephen Kenny's tenure, that that almost made up your minds in effect. If Mick McCarthy had taken the game in June and reached the Euros, that would have posed a different dilemma for all of you at the FEI, would it? Or would you have, would Stephen Kenny have taken charge at Euro 2021 regardless? We would have honoured Stephen's contract. I mean, we were, we were, I suppose we are supportive of the fact that Stephen was put in place and we would have supported that regardless of the result in June. But it would have been, uh, it may well have been a decision we didn't have to make. You know, it was a difficult decision. We inherited a really difficult problem. Uh, the way the contracts were actually constructed in the first place. And then obviously that was even more complicated when the Euros were deferred and then the playoffs were deferred. Mm. Uh, I think when the players were, I, mean, I think when I left the meeting with UEFA on Wednesday, we were pretty determined to move quickly and decisively to get it to get a result because it wasn't even Mick's interest. I mean, Mick wants to, to move forward now with his own career and uh, we wish him really, really well. I mean, he's, a, he's done a fantastic job for Ireland. He's done a fantastic job for the FEI. I've been really impressed with him. 
Um, but uh, you know, the facts are that we uh, we had contracted the Stephen. That we're very happy with that. Um, I think the next big challenge was the team we were going to put around Stephen and put a very strong team in place because mm. we have an awful lot to look forward to. Yeah, correct. And so we, at the moment, the situation is that the World Cup qualifiers start March 2021. All things going well, and it's fair to say plenty is not going well at the moment. So that's all TBC. But at the moment, World Cup qualifiers for March 2021. And Nations League, uh, Bulgaria is the first game to start in September of this year. Again, that's assuming all goes well. There's no date for uh, the Slovakia playoff, which is clearly the uh, the crucial game. Uh, have you heard murmurings that this may be pushed beyond the Bulgaria Nations League game? Do you have any control in that over um, that in that, that decision making process? Well, I'm having as much input as I can. I, um, I prefer not to have it in September, so um, we're, we would obviously prefer October, November. We're going to have nine matches now in the autumn. So we'll have three in September, three in October, and three in November. And there'll be friendlies or playoffs involved in that, plus the six Nation League matches. So the later, the better for us. Mm. Um, there is talk that they may well have the two playoff matches in the November uh, period and um, so but that hasn't been decided yet Um I think mo- for most of the countries they really don't want the first match to be a playoff uh, in September and we would obviously support that so we would prefer to have it in October November mm. I think it would be November uh, if I was if I was kind of judging from the sentiment last week I, I would say probably November but I just don't know yet yeah it's obviously a very fluid situation I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm sure I I'm sure Stephen is very keen for obvious reasons ideally he'd want more than three three or four days preparation for that game. Yeah, and, that, and that's, I mean, part of the reason why I wanted to make the decision now is to give t- Stephen and his backroom team the chance, uh, as much time as possible, to prepare. And, um, you know, we obviously wouldn't want it in, in the first match in September or indeed any of the matches in September. Mm. So we're going to try and put it back to October, November, but we don't control those things. Um, but we certainly can have an influence. Stephen's uh, contract was crystal clear. First of August, he starts and was very keen to do so, understandably. Was mixed just as clear, 31st of July, and he's done? Because we, um, you know, there was speculation it may have included an extra line about the end, till the end of the European campaign, for instance. Or was it legally very, very clear, the decision? It was very clear. I mean, the, the contracts, to be fair to the people that wrote the contracts, the contract was time-bound, and that finished at the end of July. And, and Nick, you could see that in the video that he had yesterday. He clearly understood that and was very professional about it. Um, it got much more complicated when you were putting the playoffs in the Nation League and the World Cup matches all together, because if it was just one-off, one, one, a, a playoff, one match, it would have been easier to sit down with both parties. But when you start to put in the Nations League and the World Cup and and, uh, and even the Euros next year, it just became way too complicated. I mean, you did to move quickly. Yeah, there, like there's no scenario. It would be a laughing stock if you had two managers at the same time taking different games. Yeah, and they listen, they have very different attitudes to the game as well, and they would have def- 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 very different sport teams around them. They think about the game differently, so there's no way that would work, you know. So we 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 were we were happy that um, you know the team was the right man going forward, and we were happy then when we got the team around him, and we've been working on putting a good team around him with a good lot of succession, a lot of in depth, a lot of experience. Great to see the old players coming back. Mm. Gary, you're trying to unravel a lot in the FAI at the moment. There, w- one of the aspects of the uh, contract is that there's a potential uh, bonus if Ireland reach the Euros for uh, Mick McCarthy. Is that the case? I ask that in the context of an organisation that needs all the money you can gather at the moment. Is there a bonus due to Mick McCarthy if Ireland reach the Euros? Liz, we would honour Mick's contract, but if we qualify for the Euros, um, I, we won't really have a financial problem because it actually is quite lucrative for us to qualify. And uh, I'd be happy to pay all the bonuses that people will deserve if we get there. Um, bearing in mind, Mick got us to the playoffs. Um, so, you I mean, the Euros are going to be huge. If we got there, I mean, the four matches in Dublin uh, next year, it would be fantastic to get there and actually play matches here. And... Um, uh, the financial benefits to us are huge of that. So, I, to be honest, it's it's a small priority for me if we got there in terms of bonus payments. When you say financially, the euros are lucrative enough to get almost make a lot of financial issues go away. I, I, that can't fully be the case, or or is yeah. it? If if Ireland get to the euros, where does that leave the FAI and football in this Ireland financially? It's it significantly helps us. I mean, the the, the benefits are. are Depending, there's, there's different payoffs depending on what on, on, on how far you go. So, but yeah. qualifying is is significant. 
if you qualify and and get beyond uh, the qualifying sort of group stages, it's 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 quite significant. So it would help a lot in terms of the issues that we have to deal with. So. You know, I think our immediate problems at the moment are going to be cash flow up to the end of September, given that a lot of the activities at all levels are now are sort of are not happening. You know, yeah. for a very good reasons and understandable reasons. The nine matches are helpful though, because we now have nine matches in the in the autumn period, um, so that gives us a chance to sort of reach out to the fans, put a new team in place, start looking at our Club Ireland tickets, start selling season tickets, look at the whole TV media right. So we've got an awful lot to look forward to. Mm. We're going to have a difficult three months. Um, I think you know a lot depends on the unknown as to when all this, when football can resume again, and it's not a priority, and rightly so. Sure. Um, the priorities are all for all, all the healthcare people who are supporting all the things they do at the moment and doing a great job. If, you, if we include uh, Abbottstown and you know the regional coaches around the country, uh, approximately, Gary, how many staff are employed by the FAI? We have 200. 200. I mean, effectively 200, yeah. And, and, and the vast majority of them are gra- grassroots. So we would have an awful lot of people working at grassroots level. So that's trying to increase participation rates, uh, working with the local clubs, uh, working with both the schoolboys, the amateur clubs. Uh, we're going to try and formalise that strategically uh, in a much more effective way going forward. Uh, that links in then to elite and academies and uh, under Root Doctor we you know, we've started to develop national leagues and um we're doing well there. If you look at the results under seventeen, under nineteen, under twenty one, we've a lot of good talent coming through, which is why the new team I think are excited about the future. Um they're also, you know, in many cases now staying in the League of Ireland. So the League of Ireland's getting stronger. Um I was at the Dundalk Rovers match myself uh, only recently and I was hugely impressed with the quality of football. It was a fantastic night there, actually. I, those 200 staff have had a very difficult time and they've had to listen to media reports of potential redundancies and I know there have been, obviously, uh, pay cuts. In terms of the financial situation over the next three months and hopefully beyond a, a rosier future, are those 200 jobs safe? Will there be more pay cuts? What is the status of the situation at the moment in the FAI? Well, I, think, I mean, at the moment we've managed it. We 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 announced deferrals, um, yeah. which, to be fair to all the staff, they were very supportive of. Um, that gets us through a very critical period until we can resume all activities, including all the uh, international matches that we spoke about. Um, the, the summer periods, summer summer schools, and um, a lot of the coaching that we do is quite lucrative, which we can't do that at the moment. So we need to manage carefully through to the end of August, September. Um, the staff have been great. I mean, the, the, the uh, I must say now I'm there two months and uh, they have been hugely supportive. I'm very impressed with the quality of the people on the ground. They do a really, really good job. Mm. Uh, I think a lot of it got tainted really when, when there was only one or two things really wrong in the organisation. There's a lot of good things happening. Um, I was quite impressed with the structure. You only have to look at the results. Football's a big game in Ireland and we've got a fantastic opportunity to really sort of change the brand and the images, which is what we need to do. And yeah. I think, you know, things like we're doing at the moment, I think we'll do that. No, I think that's right. And in, in fairness to this decision, this was not an easy situation for anybody. And ultimately, a very clear decision has been made and there is clarity now and there, there is much to be said uh, for that. And Mick McCarthy, to echo your point, deserves a lot of credit for the way publicly he handled the situation last night. Uh, the, with the financial situation, just to get clarity on this, because again, Clarity mm. for so many years, Gary was absent, and it's great even just to ask simple questions and get uh, simple answers to them. So uh, the FAI was expected, or the FAI revealed debt effectively of more than 50 million euro towards the back end of last year. And yeah. hopefully we get to the euros and that eases things. So uh, say we get to a point next year and, and euros money, even in an ideal world, comes in. W- what level of debt will the FAI be operating under and how manageable is that debt? Will the FAI still be able to invest? Give us a sense of the numbers. 50 million euro was the, the um, headline figure at the end of last year. Where are we with regard to that 50 million okay, well, euro? Let me put it this way, Joe. I think we assumed we wouldn't qualify. Yeah. So you know, the debt was in, in excess of 50 million. So you've got the stadium debt. And I don't really regard that as a debt because it, it's an asset. If we were to rent uh, a Viva Stadium, it would cost us more than it's actually cost us to pay back. So that was a little bit of a red herring in relation to the financial difficulties that we would have had. So the rest of it, we we basically borrowed and we're refinancing and we've got a good plan in place now to repay that debt and and keep the association going in the way that we we would want to. Um, So we're going through the middle of a restructuring program at the moment, um, which 
Well, it won't. I mean, we, we've committed to all the key stakeholders that there won't be any compulsory redundancies and uh, we're, we are, we're not looking to cut the numbers by, by a large amount, if at all, uh, to be honest, in relation to it. Um, so I think the, the plan that we have was very pessimistic. We had a lot of contingencies in it. We didn't qualify for the Euros. Um, all the things I've seen so far, leaving aside the virus, which is you know which has, has definitely had an impact, yeah. um, have been more on the upside than the downside, to be honest. So the, we're trying to work out now, and that is definitely going to hit us. Um, but um, you know, when we're looking at our scenario testing in terms of what might happen in the last three months of the year, I'm hopeful that we'll make up for that in terms of the impact. And, you know, a lot of the things that we, we made very conservative assumptions around season tickets, around the sales and matches that, that we would have, and the Club Ireland tickets. And we were only assuming, actually, that we were going to have six matches now rather than nine. Yeah. So there's a lot of upside to play for. And I think, you know, as we improve the brand and the image and all that, uh, sponsors start to get much more interested in it. Uh, they're not going to sponsor a sport. And that that has a tainted image, and I think that you know, to be fair, what we've been trying to do is put the right structures in place, put the right teams in place, and then resell the brand of football. And is it a realistic aim in the next two three years to be debt free? Is that the aspiration? Well, we don't need to be debt free. I mean, yeah. we need to be able to repay what we have. So, I mean, I, I, and I wouldn't I wouldn't be foolish enough to say we could be debt free in in two or three years. We've a lot of debt to pay back. So. Mm. I wouldn't underestimate the challenge of the burden we have in terms of trying to pay it back. But listen, I'm around a long time in business. Um, I've been in worse situations than this, so I think we can do it. What's Robbie Keane's situation then, Gary? Uh, well, we're talking to Robbie and his agent I mean, about a role in, in the association, so we'll see where that goes. Is he keen to stay on in some role? Uh, I don't know, to be honest. Um, I mean, we're, we're very open to sitting down and talking to Robbie and his agent about what role he may or may not play in, in the association. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, we're very open-minded about that, Joe. And is that, so Stephen Kenny clearly wants to choose his backroom team. That is right and proper. Robbie, for whatever reason, didn't feature in his plans. What potential other options are there for Robbie? I don't know, Joe, and I don't really want to go into that. I think I prefer to sort of, because to be fair, you know, that's a conversation we should have with either either Robbie himself or, or indeed his agent. Okay, that's perfectly understandable. Uh, listen, thanks so much for making time for us. It's much appreciated, Gary. No, at all, Joe. You're very welcome. That's Gary Owens there, who's the interim chief executive of the FAI. Uh, Dan McDonnell of the Irish Independent is with us. Afternoon, Dan. Afternoon, Joe. Uh, so, uh, further clarity there on the general thinking of the FAI and the and the uh, situation at large. And as we touched on at the top of the show when I was chatting with uh, Kenny Cunningham and, and Nathan and Neil, once that playoff was moved from June and into post 1st of August territory, the uh, FAI's thinking probably sharpened a touch. Yeah, no, it's interesting. And, and I know you, you sort of asked some sort of relevant questions there to, to Gary Owens about the uh, the likely sort of schedule for the autumn, and we we spoke about this previously, uh, and I would have written about it, and you know I would have the only slight hesitancy I would have had, it would obviously been very uncomfortable if the Slovakia game was you know three days into September and three days into a new management team, and it was the only like slight worry you might have had about the the handover, but but it did appear last week, you know there was sort of soundings from I guess the UEFA end of things that the game would. Um, possibly not be in September. And I think that made it all very clear cut, as um, as you pointed out there, that maybe if there was any justification for, you know, you know, changing things, it might be if you thought it was the next match. But even then, I mean, you could you could really deb- debate the, the rights and wrongs of that in great detail. Um, we're sitting here in April now. Um, you don't really need that sort of doubt hanging over. And, and ultimately, look, the contracts are date bound. They're, they're very clear cut. I think I think that was said earlier on in the discussions that you had. Mm. Um, I guess there was a couple of times where Mick McCarthy had spoken about July 31, but certainly I wasn't myself like 100% clear about like sometimes contracts are worded like end of campaign and yeah. and you know sometimes you can get knocked out in November and the tournaments in June and the definition of end of campaign you know can can alter but the fact it was date bound it made it fairly straightforward and um, we don't know still where the euro stands and and in terms of a I suppose a clear pathway for the Kenny era as a whole mm. I mean he's only got a contract for the World Cup campaign I don't really think he could give over half of that campaign to someone else, even if Ireland are qualified for the Euros or not. So you weigh it all up and you can understand what happened here. Yeah. 
Where I did think it was potentially a dilemma was when Niall Quinn two weeks ago came out and said, you know, we, 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 we're, we're still in the position where we're not going to know if we're even going to the Euros. We'll know on the 10th of June. I would have thought 10th of June is a good time to start worrying about that particular instance, i.e. the instance being who might take charge uh, for Euro 2021, which suggested to me there was a degree of ambiguity and it wasn't as clear cut as we've subsequently heard it is. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting that you spoke. You went into the finances there with, with Gary, and and you know maybe if you've and, I, and this is just me speculating here. Sure. This is just you know discussion, but you know maybe if you've qualified in June and and you have that sort of nine million euro from qualification, you know does it give you would it have given them more flexibility to to work at solutions? But I don't know about that. Like I, I you know, I, I, I as don't in financially know to work a solution which may you know maybe said Stephen Kenny, can we pause things and give you you, you know improved terms that kind of a solution possible po I, I don't know i mean i think the thing is that like as i said stephen kenny has uh, a, a two-year contract to be the senior manager up until 2022 yeah it's the biggest job of his life um you know he he negotiated that deal so if if you were to ever trying to propose something that changed that what can you do i don't i don't think s simple money would would do it you, mm. you might have to I mean, this is this is off the radar now, so we're just completely talking about hypothetical scenarios. But like, you might have had to give someone extra years on their contract, but that's obviously a big commitment to make as well sure. when you haven't sort of, you know, given someone a chance in the job. So, like, I mean, look what Denmark have done. You know, the you know th things happened. Um, it's massively like we're in a sort of a, a pandemic, a, a situation we could never have expected, but. You know, Aga Ryder qualified the team for the tournament. He had his appointment lined up, and the most straightforward thing to do was to honour that. And, I, and as you know, I, I made the point in, in sort of written pieces across the last 24 hours. I think the FBI and people were conscious that, you know, this is a, is you know, it's a so-called new era. And if one of the first things you do is to try and, you know, chip around with contacts, you yeah. know, ducking and diving, as one person put to me, and and trying to work out these sort of. Uh, plaster cast solutions as you go along that's not really what they're meant to be i mean for the people in the fbi now it's very straightforward they inherited this it's not really you know this was something an unorthodox situation that they inherited and they're strictly adhering to those contracts that they inherited and in many respects you know for them to start messing around with things would be way more complicated and potentially you know very bruising and i think in fairness to mick mccarthy's credit by all accounts of any discussions and, and conversations that had, you know, what's coming back is that he did make it very easy for them. He he didn't, you know, make things difficult. I yeah. don't think, you know, he would have wanted any kind of sort of civil war or something breaking out over something like this. Uh, the contracts were the law, I guess, and, and they guided the decisions. Dan, stay with us. We're going to take a short break and then we'll be joined by Damien Delaney and Gary Breen in just one moment. Football on Off The Ball With Paddy Power The greatest football partnership since Shearer and Owen The Future Proof Podcast How does this make you feel? What if I scratch the microphone? Or pull apart this Velcro? Creeped out, completely bewildered like I am? Well, then you probably don't experience ASMR. Or, you know, you're just having a normal reaction to a very weird promo. What is ASMR? We'll be looking at the science of strange tingles on Future Proof. The Future Proof Podcast. Proudly supported by Science Foundation Ireland. Listen and subscribe to the podcast now on Newstalk.com or on the Newstalk app. QuoteDevil.ie can save you money on your car insurance, van insurance or home insurance. QuoteDevil.ie also specialise in car insurance for first-time drivers, young drivers and difficult-to-insure cases. The Quote Devil's always got one hell of a quote. Quote Devil Limited is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Hi, I'm Quiva Debarra from Throkra. I hope you and those you love are safe and well. In Ireland, we're doing all we can to protect each other. But can you imagine not being able to wash your hands because you don't have running water? That's the reality for many people Throker supports. This virus knows no borders, but neither should our compassion. Now more than ever, we need your support to protect them. Please give whatever you can. Call 1850 408 408 or visit throker.org. Throker, until love conquers fear. With Virgin Mobile, there's nothing hidden. 
Now you can try unlimited 4G data, calls and texts for only 15 euro a month for 12 months. All on a 30-day contract. And better yet, everyone can try it. It's an offer that's bigger than big. See virginmobile.ie. Virgin Mobile. Nothing hidden. Fair usage and T's and C's apply. 25 euro a month after offer ends 3rd of June 2020. At Bank of Ireland, we want our customers and colleagues to stay safe and well. Now more than ever, it's important to know that your financial well-being is our priority. We have a range of supports available for our personal and business customers with easy online applications. Our dedicated staff are working to support you. But if you're cocooning or self-isolating at home, you can now nominate a family member or trusted friend to do your banking for you. We're also giving a 1 million euro emergency fund to support our communities right now. To find out more, visit bankofireland.com. Take care. Bank of Ireland. Bank of Ireland is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. COVID-19 is a major public health emergency here in Ireland and around the world. It's having a big impact on every aspect of our lives. We are now asked to stay at home with limited exceptions. This is especially hard for older people and those who've been advised to cocoon. Being isolated from friends and family is hard for everyone. So right now, it's important that we look out for each other and look after our neighbours. That's why national government, local government and the community and voluntary sectors have all come together to create the Community Call. To make sure that anyone who needs help can get help. And to make sure that people who would like to volunteer in their community can help where they are most needed. If you need help, if you know someone who needs help, or if you'd like to offer help, please call 0818 222 024 or call your local authority Community Call Helpline. All the details are live now at gov.ie. Supported by the Government of Ireland. Football on Off The Ball. With Paddy Power, the greatest football partnership since Jeff and Heskey. Now you're welcome back. Joe Malloy here with you this Sunday afternoon on Off The Ball. We have Dan McDonnell of the Irish Independent still with us. We are about to be joined by Gary Breen and Damien Delaney, former Republic of Ireland internationals. Dan mentioned just before the ad break there that Mick McCarthy, when he was approached with the FAI's thinking, made things very easy for them and did not want to create some kind of civil war and uh, went with good grace. He spoke to FAI TV last night. We played the full five, six minutes interview that Mick did. Just to give you a sense of how he departed the scene publicly, at least, here is Mick McCarthy talking yesterday evening. Yeah, well, I mean, as you say, Cole, extraordinary circumstances for everybody, actually, uh, with the coronavirus that's going on, the way it's, uh, football's been cancelled I mean, worldwide. So, uh, you know, the European Championships has had to be done as well. Uh, what are my thoughts? Uh, I mean, I said in December the 1st, 2018, when I took the job, that I'd be, lo- I'd be leaving on July the 31st, whatever, you know, come what may. But those, those discussions were based on us qualifying and then maybe doing really well in the Euros. But I said I was leaving, and that's still the case, albeit, of course... It's, it's been uh, it's been brought forward because of what's happening worldwide. Actually, it, it, it's been a difficult decision and difficult discussions for everyone, and particularly for you because you started this job and now you don't get to finish it. Yeah, well, that's that's usually disappointing, but I fully understand it as well. I see Aguirre Ride is the same, isn't he, with the, the Denmark coach who's a pal of mine. He uh, he started the same uh, competition and he's leaving now because that is a successor was already picked to take over, and mine was the same. It's, it's disappointing I can't finish it off. I think we've had a really good campaign. Uh, we were almost there in November when we played Denmark. Sadly, we didn't. And so the playoffs have been pushed back, and I fully understand it. You know, and Stephen's been contracted to take over in, in August, and uh, good luck to him. He'll get the chance now to qualify. Mick McCarthy speaking to FAI TV last night. We have Gary Breen and Damien Delaney with myself and Dan now. And Gary, that is a testament to Mick McCarthy's character. It's not surprising. It's typical of him. He could have made this thing very acrimonious. It could have left a very bitter taste. He has decided not to do that. He has, yeah. Good afternoon. But I was just listening to Dan there and saying Mick wouldn't want to go down another civil war. He's been down that road before. He wouldn't have won it like he wouldn't have won it against Roy. And I think he's done the right thing. He's experienced, he's wise, he's grisly enough now to realise that 
the tide had really turned a little bit. The contracts were in place. There was no need to try and hang around. And I think the clean break now, although it's, it's the result of a ridiculous decision to appoint two managers at the same time two years ago, but I do feel like that with momentum, the swell that was going towards Stephen, I think that probably this is the right decision. Yeah, I wasn't sure what you would think, actually, because you're, you're a huge Mick fan and always have been. And I, I agree yeah, with you. I know, you know, the, go on. It is, it is in terms of that. I think a lot is um, assumed that I am Mick's man. And without a cliche, I, I would always put Ireland first. And if I felt that Mick was the right man to take us forward, I, I, I do look at the situation and think it's a difficult one to digest, really, because I feel that perception has played a big impact on this in terms of Mick has been tarred with the fact that he's... he's um, old school, whereas Stevens branded as his new age manager. I don't think the facts back up both of them. I think Mick is expansive when he's got the players to do that. I think that Steven is practical, pragmatic at times, wanting to win games as opposed to looking good. So I think that hasn't been a, a real true reflection. But I do look at it in, in terms of, of what's happened here. And it was interesting. I really enjoyed listening to Gary Owens talking there because on that aspect, it was interesting to see that he mentioned we have to improve the brand, the image. And I feel that perception has played a big role in that to get Stephen in there to work forward now because I think that too many people have wrongly assumed that Mick hasn't moved far enough away from Martin O'Neill's tenure. Results may suggest, and, and the performances might, but I think Mick McCarthy made a massive difference in terms of taking over from a squad that was on its knees. Damien Delaney, your reaction to the decision? Yeah, I think it's the right decision. Uh, I'm really pleased. Uh, first and foremost, uh, looking forward to the future, you know. Um, I probably disagree with a couple of things that Gary said there, you know. I mean, Mick's come in and we've had Mick, uh, Martin O'Neill and Trapatoni and we've had the same ways of just managers, you know, without being too strong on it, that didn't really believe, you know. Happy with draws in Denmark and Trapatoni obviously had his his say over the years uh, about the Irish team, Martin O'Neill, the same. Uh, I think Mick did very well with his experience to kind of improve the brand because, you know, with the way Martin O'Neill tenure ended with the media, uh, Mick was obviously very, very clever, very smart and uh, in handling the media, but the football was the same. Uh, and realistically, I think it's the right decision moving forward because you can't look at our qualifying campaign because it's just gone and, and say it's a success in any way. No matter what lens you look at it through, it wasn't, you know, with three wins, uh, two against Gibraltar and one against Georgia. Uh, we were in a very, very uh, fortunate group where there wasn't a, a real superpower. Uh, uh, and the playoff spot that we have, I won't say it was earned because, you know, it was almost, it's almost like you get out of jail free card. Uh, Georgia are in playoff as well. And we're in a playoff. So realistically, uh, two wins against Gibraltar was enough to get you into a playoff. So um, it's just unfortunate the way it's happened. But I'm really, really excited and I'm really, really looking forward to. Uh, uh, breath of fresh air coming in. Do you want to come back on any of that, Gary? Um, well, I, I just in terms of Damien's obviously got his opinions. He, he was quite vocal about that initially um, a couple of months back, saying that Stephen should take over for the playoffs now, which I, I thought was a nonsense at the time, and I still think it was. Obviously, the scenario with coronavirus has changed everything, so I understand that the contracts are signed and this has to happen. What was interesting in terms of listening to Gary Owens, again, was talking about a succession plan. He mentioned that again. I don't agree with this initial one, but certainly it looks like there's a framework now in place that likes of Duffer coming back, Keith, John O'Shea coming in now, where they're looking to maybe build those guys to potentially step up in the future. So that was interesting to listen to. Mm, I suppose, well, the initial one, certainly not of Gary Owens is doing, but getting the likes of Duff and Andrews and John O'Shea back in the fold, I think makes a lot of sense to a lot of people because Damien, you know, the, the Gary's generation, for instance, uh, none of them really given much of a chance or an opportunity to make their mark on Irish football when it comes to the management side of things. And uh, really, we should be availing of those players who have a loyalty to the country and want to do something for the country, like, for instance, a Damien Duff. Yeah, I mean, but ultimately, coaches are judged on their coaching ability, you know. I mean, yeah, exactly. it's, it's all well and good getting in ex players for the, you know, the PR and it looks good and all that. But ultimately, these guys have to prove themselves as coaches. I know Damien Duff is really, really well thought of in Celtic. Uh, obviously, Keith has been working with Stephen Kenny and, and John O'Shea is a young coach, but, you know, they have to prove themselves. They they, they might get a free pass initially, but ultimately they, they're going to have to produce results and produce performances and show that there has been a shift uh, or a pivot in Irish football away from pragmatic kind of percentage football uh, that we've had for the last uh, 10 years. 
Um, so these guys are brought in and, and people are going to look for for improvements uh, straight away, you know, definitely in the style of play and stuff. So, um, but I, I just one, one thing I want to say with the FA, I think they've done a good job here, you know, they've been pretty decisive, mm. you know, uh, they've been pretty swift uh, and they've been pretty um, emphatic in, in, in choosing the path they're going down. Uh, and I think they've, they've shown good leadership at the minute, Gary Owens and, and the team there. Uh, and I think they need to be commended, you know, obviously it's difficult to say whether, yeah. you know, yeah. it's going to be a success or not. Go on. On that, yeah. Joe, I've never, I've never, I've never felt um, that the FA have not provided an opportunity for ex-players. I've never been on that bandwagon. I totally agree, and I've been quite vocal with you many times, Joe, saying being a footballer and being a coach is totally different remit, mm. totally different skill set. You've got to go and learn your trade. Mm. I've never felt for one moment that anyone who's had a great island career as a player should automatically be brought in as a coach before before doing all their work, their due diligence. I like the fact that Duff has gone and coached the young teams in Ireland, then gone away because he's been acknowledged as a good coach, got his opportunity at Celtic. Likewise, John O'Shea's making the name for himself at Reading. But Keith O'Neill as well, I came across him coaching for Peterborough. He was coaching for MK Don. I want to see those guys going out and learning their trade. Not for one moment do I like to see people fast-tracked having had no coaching experience whatsoever just because they played. Yeah, that's fair enough. And to be fair, Kenny has been allowed to pick his backroom staff here. It's not like Roy, uh, Robbie Keane rather has been imposed on him, Gary. No, and, and, and rightly so. I don't think you should inherit anyone. I think it's too important that you've got your staff around you who you believe in, who you think can do the job at hand and who you trust ultimately. And if he doesn't think that Robbie's that man, then Robbie has to make way. Simple as that. Uh, the other key thing, and Dan, sorry, Dan McDonald's still with us. I'll bring you in in just one moment, Dan. The other key thing here, and, and Gary Owens alluded to it, is that there is probably concrete hope, Gary, that Stephen Kenny's first game in charge will not be a Slovakia playoff of you know, huge stakes, that he may get the Bulgaria game and the Finland game in the Nations League to at least work with the players and get his feet under the table before the Slovakia game. You suspect that was probably key in their decision-making as well? Is that for me? Sorry, yeah. No, listen, I think that's very important. And I think if I look at the whole scenario based in Stephen Kenny getting this opportunity, it's a wonderful opportunity to have the ability to be named island manager, to, but to effectively have 18 months to prepare for the role and to learn about how important it is to coach in short spaces, not at club football, not where you're working with players for day in, day out, week in, week out, month in. You've got to have that message. You've got to get it across quickly in a limited amount of time. He's had an opportunity now to work in that framework within the under 21. And now he's got that. Also, that was impressive. Listen to Gary Owens, that they're going to do everything they can to delay that playoff, to give Stephen as much time as he can to get his message across. I think this island manager is getting an opportunity. And I don't think any international manager I've ever seen get an opportunity to be prepped and given every chance to be successful. I think it's an incredible chance for him. Dan, a question uh, to you as somebody who's been around Stephen Kenny for a long time and has a feel for the man. This obviously, you know, there, there's big expectations over what he can do as manager. He has done fantastic things at different levels. He's got his teams playing a brand of football that we don't see Irish teams playing. I'm thinking in particular of Dundalk in Europe and how they bossed games in Europe. And, and so there'll be an expectation he can, he can do that fairly quickly with Ireland. Has he spoken himself about the process of trying to get a team to play that kind of football? Is it something he feels takes time, you know, it, it can, can key things be done fairly quickly? Because, to be honest with you, we're looking for the fairly quickly route. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good, you know, it's a good question. And, and obviously what Gary said there before, that I, I do actually agree that I think some of the, uh, you know, the predictions about what Stephen Kenny's Ireland might be like um, are sort of idealistic and almost building you know, unbelievable expectations. Like, as, as he sort of alluded to, I mean, Stephen Kenny's teams have also been pragmatic and, you know, at various times they've, they've found ways to win games. So I think maybe just sometimes people are describing it as like, you know, a, a massive, like we're going to suddenly be playing like Spain or something 10 years ago. It's not really going to be like that, I don't think. But I think what you probably have is someone whose mindset bottom line approach would be very positive you know I think that would be in terms of probably team selection it'll be interesting to see how much this happens straight away or over time I think you'll see you know he, he will favour defenders who like to step out and take a pass but he'll also you know his team's always been very good on set pieces and other you know attention attention to detail you know so it's 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 not just sort of a you know this sort of a, a someone with a sort of an idea on a blackboard coming in. I think it'll be more practical and and we've seen with even the twenty one side across the last year, I guess you know or the, or the year that he had that you know in terms of personnel, 
you know, he, he mixed things and, and matched things at time in terms of the use of Troy Parrott and Aaron Connolly and, and various players and, you know, left people out at various times. And I think also as well, I, I think he's very much conscious of, um, I think, you know, in terms of the staff as well and the role and a very defined roles that they will all have within his group. And I think it's not just a case of, I don't know, the suggestion that it's just like, let's bring in some high-profile people. I think, yeah. you know, Damien Duff, Damien Duff will replace Jim Crawford in terms of his role within the group. And I think he's built up a good working relationship with Keith Andrews, Andrews, who's, I think, you know, very good in terms of operating with players. So I think you will see over time uh, maybe a change in philosophy in terms of how the team plays. But I think it has to be over time. That's the only way that it can work. Yeah. And you know, I like he's you know I think he's at times in his in his managerial career he's had lows. Um, I think it was very important that he was allowed to pick his own staff. I think that was absolutely vital that this is um, someone who's been given a you know control over the plan. And as, I do agree with what Gary said. Like he has been given a great opportunity, a platform because people really want this to work. Um, and I would say that. You know, every Irish manager for the last 10 years, has their, their remit has been to qualify for the next tournament for financial reasons, come what may. There's never really been any instruction beyond that. And I think at times that is very much informed decisions. And while Ireland still need to qualify for tournaments, that doesn't change. I think there's more of a realisation now that you have to, to give this project a bit of time to work. Um, mm. And it'll be interesting to see, I guess, you know, how patient people remain with that if it does take that small bit of time. And throwing the playoffs in there early, it's unusual. Uh, but I, I think his approach will be um, that you can go and win it. You can go and do it. And, 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 and probably personnel selections will probably be quite positive in that regard. Damien, Dan, what's, you know, Dan, what's, what's, what's your... Yeah, go on, Damien. Immediately, Dan, sorry. Uh, that One thing we should see straight away is... Uh, a, a different level of confidence uh, in the team in so far as our starting positions as a back four. We're not just going out and, and, and waiting to be attacked and counter-attack and set pieces. That we'll see a different kind of uh, appearance to the, to the team in so far as the areas of the pitch that they're in. I mean, that's something that can immediately be done. That would come with confidence, you know? Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, like, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, you know, players like Matt Doherty and, you know, are, are, are involved prominently from the start and, you know, uh, sort of positive selections in wide areas and, uh, you know, and, and even just how the team will play. Like, it's it's a bit of a weird one, though, because we just don't know how long he's going to have before, you know, the, 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 the key games. And, uh, I mean, you lads know way more than me about that. Like, you know, you have a new manager and a new voice in the group. I mean, how long does it take to get a, get a handle on what he wants from things? And that's why the timing of the Slovakia game and that not being first was obviously probably made things a lot easier for them. Gary, do you want to come in, to come in on that, to Gary? Players, yeah, that opening gambit to your players, that first team talk, those first training sessions are massive because players can see very quickly through someone who's bluffing, who talks a good game, might be great in front of the camera. Can you produce it on the pitch? Is the message clear? And I think what we will have, everyone talk about his lack of experience at international level, but this is a manager who's been managing for over 20 years, so he'll have a template in place. He'll know how to deliver that message. And I think that's, in, that's something to look really forward to because if you think of this group of players who is not our best ever, I think at times they were hung out to dry under Martin O'Neill in terms of not being prepped well mm. enough, literally naming the team just before the kickoff. But it was interesting. I was always got a lot of time for Dan in terms of he spoke brilliantly there. And I think sometimes it needs to be aimed at people like Damien who think that Stephen's suddenly going to start throwing the ball out to center half at right wing, left wing, and we're going to be the most expansive team we've ever seen. Damien, you're saying about the starting positions of defenders giving them confidence. Maybe McCarthy would have done all that, regardless of what you're well, saying. We never, saw, we never saw it. We did, see it. Okay. we did see centre-halves playing up on the halfway line to congest that midfield. It was in stark contrast to our centre-half defence defending that 18 yard box. That was a massive difference. If you didn't see that, I'd be a very surprised, Ben, in my experience, you are as a player. In the groups, between Martin and Mick, What's that? Say that again. Sorry, you cut out. So it's a different. Oh, you're saying that Mick uh, made a big difference under under Mick than under Martin O'Neill. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, like I did. yeah, I do. Absolutely, I do. I think he made a massive difference in terms of what he gave I those thought. players. I do. I do believe that. Yeah, absolutely, I, I do. I, I couldn't disagree more there. I, I I think that we still it was the same template of just go out and counter attack and defend. And you know, we never had any. You know, we tried it against Denmark, and we never had any real plan how to keep the ball, how to move it through the different thirds in the pitch, how to sustain attacks when we got teams pinned in. 
so we clear it, we pick up the second balls and sustain attack so we can get constant pressure on teams. Yeah, I don't see it. I'm not saying that uh, there's going to be a huge difference straight away when uh, when Stephen comes in, but there'll definitely be a difference in, in belief in terms of he won't be going in the media saying things like, oh, you know, it's t- snatch your hand off to go to Denmark and get a draw. That might be in terms of how he delivers himself in front of the camera, Mick. I'm not saying that Stephen will be saying that. But it's very different in terms of having played under Mick and having um, know what's expected of you of a defender. I know for a fact that I'd seen it, not just going back, because I think it's a long time since I played for him and, and I'd be remiss to think that any manager hasn't evolved over that time. I hope he has. But I could see very much a big difference in how we had played. The results probably didn't suggest it. In terms of ball retention, I think we were in good positions. But again, the level of the players, their inability themselves to look after the ball was much more prevalent than the fact that they didn't have passing patterns of play set up from training. Well, I, I, I disagree there. I didn't see... I mean, you can blame that on the players if you want, but, I mean, just con- continuous, like, talking down the players, saying that we don't want the players, we don't want the players. I mean, that needs to stop, man. Never heard I mean, that. You never heard that from Mick McCarthy, we don't have the players. That's Martin no, O'Neill. You're, 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 you're mixing up the two uh, regimes there. But I said I heard it from you just there. That is the quality of player that we don't have. I mean, that needs to stop. I've just away. said it. I've just said it. But you just um, said that Mick was saying we don't have it. Mick never said it. No, he was saying he was I saying you'd said it, Gary. Gary, 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 he was Gary, that... Gary. Sorry, he was he was making the point that you had just said it. He wasn't saying Mick ever said it. All right, okay, fair enough. But I, I, I think all of us will agree we don't have players that we've had the quality we had in future years. I don't think this is our strongest generation. I think we'd all well, agree with that. But well, at would the say, same time, um, I still believe that those players should be able to look after the ball better than they have done. I'm, I'm not saying that we've got world-class players by any stretch of imagination, but I'm saying the players are better than what we've shown in the last four years, uh, in, you know, two years under uh, under Mick and two years under, last two years under Martin. The group is better than what they've shown. I'm not saying we're world-class, or I'm not putting us in that bracket, but we're better than what we've shown. Uh, listen, I, that's listen, something I, I said all along under Martin O'Neill that I think we're they're better. Once they've been coached and given an idea of what they expect to go out onto the pitch, I think they were given that under Mick. And I've come on to Joe and said, listen, people think I'm Mick McCarthy's man and probably the way I'm arguing now is suggest that that's the case, but it's not. I'm only giving my argument on what I have seen under Mick, under no real like loyalty to him as such. No, I accept that. And you, but, you, look, you're, but, but, you're always very yeah. honest. But can I just ask you, Gary, then, if we go through the campaign very, very briefly here, uh, the Gibraltar yeah. game, AstroTurf, Windy, you know, that's a mess. And then yeah. the 1-0 win over Georgia, that's the night of the tennis balls. There his first two games, you give him a pass. The Denmark draw away from home, you'd have to say, yeah, there was a sense then he'd put the spirit back in the team for sure. Then they beat Gibraltar. Then September, it's a one-all draw at home to Switzerland. In October of last year, the nil-all draw away to Georgia, 91st in the world. I watched some of it back last night. That yeah. just was a poor performance. That was the night Connolly came on late on. Georgia passed the ball better, there's no doubt. And then there was the Swiss 2-0 win in Switzerland the following um, uh, week. Yeah. And then our last game was the one-all draw at home to Denmark, where in fairness, they had a bit of a go and it was up-tempo. But I don't know, could you really say in the midst of all that there was massive improvement either? Like, there's more in the group there, no? No, listen, I, I, that's what I'm saying. I, they, they, the, those players are capable of it, but they haven't shown it, have they? But my argument again is... is One minute, let me finish. Let me finish the question. Let me finish the question. My argument is is that the the belief was that it's not changed from Martin O'Neill. It's changed massively in terms of the work that was done on the training ground. It has. There's no... There's no... Let's just listen to the players in terms of what they're saying. There's a clear message we know we're expected to do. You know what it's like with players. It slowly seeps out, doesn't it? We heard it all the time under O'Neill that certain players didn't know what they were expected to do. Certain players didn't even know if they are playing within 20 minutes of the game as such. Mm. So that stuff has improved. Now, listen, in terms of results, I'm not trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes. I've been massively disappointed with their performances, but I don't think it's been at um, because they have not been coached how to play on the training field. I generally don't believe that. But, but Gary, I, can I take your point there? So you're saying that uh, Mick McCarty did do the work on the, on the training ground. We do have better players, but the players haven't shown it. I mean... I, I'm not blaming Mick. I'm just saying that it's time to move in a new direction and instill super confidence in players that when they're going out onto the pitch, they genuinely feel that when 21s were playing against Italy in the 21s, I'm pretty sure that, that, that Stephen wasn't talking about what oh, we yeah, get a draw today. He took the game to them. I remember watching it when they played it in Tala. He took the game to, to Italy. And I think that's the, the, the road we need to go down. And listen, you're saying that Mick improved the confidence uh, from 
from Martin O'Neill, but that wouldn't be hard because it was right on the floor. So we did move it along. From the state, Stephen Kenny's going to move it much further along. So well, that's uh, the hope. Uh, yeah, that's the hope. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. But that's that's kind of different to what you did say there. But yeah, no, that's what I hope. I hope so. And we're looking at the scenario now and thinking in terms of this succession plan. Well, and it's different how you how you phrase this because ultimately you're thinking, well, why don't we just put Stephen in to begin with? And because he. You know, time has been wasted. I'm not saying that what Mick has done was a waste of time because I think, as I just explained, I think he's made a massive difference to that squad in terms of picking it up at their knees. But you look at the scenario now and it's a massive... Listen, people are putting a lot of faith in Stephen. He hasn't got a CV that warrants that. Everyone keeps talking about Dundalk, but he's failed elsewhere in other jobs and success as well. So he has still a lot to prove. But Don't I... build him up so much. Give him some time. Yes, no, no, give him time, absolutely. And every manager across 20 years is going to have failures. But what, what he has done of late has been very impressive and, and warrants the position. And even, Gary, you, you'd have to admit, and before you tell me there's a huge difference between the under-21 setup and seniors, I appreciate that massively. But we have not seen our under-21s play a brand of football like this very often over the last however many years. The, he has done something different with this under-21 group. And so the hope is, and yes, the word is hope rather than guarantee, but the hope is we can see something a bit different from the senior side. Well, listen, the hope is that those players are able to step up or that type of football is, is enabled to be implemented to the senior squad now and that they've got the capability to do that. that that's brilliant. And I, I, um, I met um, Stephen Kenny for the first time just before Christmas. I had about half an hour, just bumped into him and he was engaging and he, he sounded sorry, he sounded meticulous. I enjoyed the conversation. But what I took more stock out of anything, and certainly watching that under-21 team, was talking to Keith, who's my friend, and telling me what, what, what they're trying to achieve, what they've done, what they've done well, what they need to work on. So that was, that was music to my ears in terms of prepping this squad. And that's what I want to focus on in terms of what he's going to do potentially, is that they're going to leave no stone unturned. Yeah. But don't tell me, and, and, and we'll leave it there after this, don't tell me that Mick McCarthy wasn't doing that in terms of preparation. But it is exciting. I'm not want to keep going on about it. I want to look forward, and I am um, I'm hoping that he lives up to the billing that he has got. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. I think you, you both made fair points, Dan. On the on the twenty ones, is there anybody who may be ready and waiting to make a quick jump, a quick elevation under Kenny? Yeah, I mean it's strange. I mean the whole normal passage of time is sort of suspended now by obviously this long stoppage that we're now facing, and you know guys who are you know you wonder about their experience, but like six seven months down the line, it, it could yeah. be a different story. I mean someone like Jason Malumbi, um, you know who who probably wouldn't have been ready in September October. And he could have had an argument over March, say, for example. But we're now talking, uh, you know, come November or September or October or whenever, I think, you know, if the English season resumes, and even if it hasn't, the experience he's had with Millwall, I think someone like him would be very well positioned. I think what's interesting is that I think Kenny has always liked uh, a number nine with, say, the attributes of someone like Adam Ida. Um, and it's interesting, like Troy Parrott is obviously, you know, the, the, the great wide hope. But even within the 21 setup, he might have played a, a Parrott as a, you know, a 10 or even on the left at one side at one time. But he'd like to have an Ida or an Afalabi, that strong running sort of number nine in the middle of, say, a 4-3-3 type formation. So I think so. now we've seen David McGoldrick, yes. slightly yeah. different type of player. Um, but look, he's actually done some amazing work in that role. But I think, you know, they are the players that spring to mind to me initially. Maybe, you know, over time, centre half. But I think I think he'll probably rate someone like John Egan, who comes out and likes to get involved with play. Again, that's just me speculating. But I think of the 21s, I think a player with someone like Ida's attributes, he's one that I think could come into it pretty quickly. I think Parrott will be around it. I think Aaron Connolly, he probably needs to get his head back in at a yeah. club level a small bit and Malumbi I think is someone who in six months time I think we might view him in different terms. Fellas we're just out of time clock's coming against us. Dan I'm sure we'll be reading about it tomorrow in the Irish Independent. My thanks to you Damien Delaney much appreciated. Thanks Damien Thanks Joe. Cheers and Gary Breen as ever thanks for making time Gary much appreciated No thanks guys have a good day Cheers. Gary Breen, Damien Delaney and Dan McDonald there will podcast that full chat if you're coming uh, late to it and of course there'll be more across the week I'm sure hopefully we'll hear from Stephen Kenny in the uh, coming days and Mick McCarthy I suspect as well a short break news headlines and then a golf weekly special featuring Paul McGinley on the way
Football on Off The Ball. With Paddy Power, the greatest football